Hello and welcome to another thrilling and exciting home movie by me. Today we're going to be working on this silver V cable inner with an injected 202 and try and get it to run and drive. All right, just to point out the elephant in the room, the car has no distributor. I have no idea how long the distributor has been off. I've looked down the hole. Um, there is leaves and shit in there, so that is absolutely fantastic. Same with the PCV. Um, so I'm gonna have to jump in there with a vacuum before I can put the Dizzy in there. I've already got one ready. I gotta rewire it because it's got some dodgy shit on it. And it did have a there was a kill switch wired into that one. The wiring on this thing, um, it's probably the best, to be honest. It is, you know, a mess, but the only call for concern is where this big, thick red wire is meant to be. That's normally a main power, so yeah, I gotta go through my diagrams and figure out what the hell that's for. Uh, what else is there? Oh yeah, these dents in the row. So I've got one here and I've got one here. So they're, they're not great at all. I've already started work on this thing. Um, I didn't bother filming it. The rear brake was locked on because the handbrake was on. Um, when I took the console out of this, the handbrake was seized and I just ripped it up. I really wanted it for that one and it looks great in there. And you know, that was a problem for the later jack, which the later jack is now the jack now. So I had to drag this thing around. Luckily with the sludge, it uh, just drifted on the you know driveway and shit but let's get this into the shed we'll vacuum this out i'm not comfortable putting water anywhere near this thing even though it's probably seen a lot of water but uh yeah we'll clean it up i'll rewire that and then we'll uh see if it cranks I forgot what I was doing. Oh. So to find top dead center, I'm gonna stick a screwdriver in here. I can feel that it's down still, and as I crank it over. I'll see the screwdriver come up if I can get onto this balancer box. That's the wrong one. And I can hear this thing coming up. It feels like it's got good compression. Well, you see 
that piston's all the way at the top. Because this is all grimy, I'm gonna... I'm gonna put the distributor and the starter in, and oil in, because it's barely got any. And then I'm gonna crank it to make sure time is right. Not enough. Too much. Now these are a nightmare to fix, especially because this has extractors. putting my face in here and breathing in all the rat shit and rat nests. Alright, it's got oil, it's got a distributor. The cap is off. I want to check if the timing gear is okay. If the distributor rotor button doesn't spin, then we know that the timing gear is no good. I got my hot wire, battery, oil, let's go. Fantastic. Little bit of a gallop, but I'm happy with that. Right. <laughs> Timing gear's fucked. No. Nah. I'm I'm sure I'm looking at it. Take a good look where that distributor cap clip is sitting right now. It comes in the factor in the future in this video. So I found the problem why it snapped that, that gear off on the bottom of the distributor. It was entirely my fault and I'll show you what I did wrong. All right, so what I did wrong, you can probably already see it if you're smart. So, focus. So, where am I? So, this arm got hooked on one of these and somewhere had to give, so that was entirely my fault. So, me leaving the cap off to try and see if the rotor button was turning caused the rotor button to stop turning. But, Everything's back together. I've already whizzed it over again. I've hooked up a oil pressure gauge. Interesting enough, even though this motor looks terrible, when I took off the factory sender, there was oil already oozing out. So, you know, I'm not holding my breath, but you know, it'd be nice if I had oil pressure. Oh, no fucking way. Something. Timing's out. Yeah! Did you hear that? That was the Chevy. Big block. You're gonna flatter. All right, so the shed is empty again. You would have seen the car just there. The car is now outside. Now that's as far as I can go with starting the car for now. I need a few more things. I need a fuel tank, I need an ECU, and I need a bonnet. A bonnet is irrelevant in starting the car. But this is where you guys come in because I can't afford these things. I need you guys to join my Patreon, which is in the link down below, so you guys can pay the, me so that I can have nice things 
so that I don't have to work for these things. I can just make silly YouTube videos and you guys pay for it. Even though YouTube pays for it, I want you guys to pay for it as well because I'm going to double dip into this. So, Patreon link is down below. So, please <laughs> join the Patreon and I'll pretend to be your friend and all that stuff. So, stop it. I'm trying to get money. In, in all seriousness, um, the car is outside because it has an oil leak. Um, I'm cleaning it up so I can diagnose it and we will be back, hopefully with parts and an oil leak. The best thing about cars is that you get faced with obstacles that make zero sense, so... We won't move. I don't understand. So I think I figured it out. As you can see, there's uh, been some serious contact there. And if we look at the drum, it uh, it's got contact points and uh, non-contact points. So when the drum's on, the top is touching, but we look down here and we've got a huge gap. So when I put the wheel on there, acts as a spacer and then a wheel nut and do it up even tighter it pinches it up here so you can't move it so my resolution for this right now is I'm not going to have any drums on it I will on this side I don't really need it I'm not driving it I'm just trying to get it to run so I managed to use all the degreaser that I had on hand but I got the engine to come up looking like this it still needs a lot of a clean but it is night and day from what it did look like while I was there, I also gave the underneath a rinse in preparation for putting the fuel tank in. I then decided to have a look at what it was like on the inside of the car because it, I could smell not only rat shit, but I could smell that there was a moisture in there and that really needed to be dealt with because all that carpet harboring moisture and wetness is a really a quick end to these cars. While I was there, I also noticed this. On the inside of the door jams, there was a rubber that went all the way along the door jam, but it also had a rubber on the doors, which is really funny because this is the only car I have that opens and shuts nicely. Oh, fuck. See how well these hog water. Ah, oh, I'm in the puddle. You can't spray the inside of a car. That's where inside things happen. Use a scrub. Hang on, I've got a brush for this. Now that was quite an intrusive way to clean the inside of this car, but it really needed it. It absolutely stunk. The mice were that bad in this car that they had even managed to chew through a whole seatbelt. Don't ask me how.
And now that that's done, it's time to feed these arseholes. Come on. Once I'd fed the rose, I finished off the night by cleaning up the shifter and painting a few bits. The next morning, I fitted up the shifter, cut out a neutral safety switch out of another car, and then soldered it in. And then I fit up the ECU. I needed to do all this so that I could try and start this car off the key, or in my case, the key. All right, so if you've ever seen a Holden from pre-19 whatever, you would know what this looks like. So this is the ignition switch. So I've got my wiring all hooked up for the shifter. So the neutral safety should work. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide this across and I'm gonna see if I can crank it from the key. So that's on position. Oh, I've got nothing. Some idiot left the purple wire off the starter so it wouldn't have started. Beautiful. So I can start it from here. And once I put it into the on position, once the fuel pump's in there, that will send power to the trigger wire at the fuel pump once I get a fuel pump. And then I can start it from that. So that is progress. All right, first look under the car. Well, for you guys, not for me, I've already been under here. As you can tell, this car has spent some time on its guts, which is a real shame because uh, that exhaust from the tip back looks mandrel bent, or it was. Now it's just uh, rusty. Looks a bit, bit average there where it joins from the extractors, but yeah, it looked like it would have been a pretty, pretty decent exhaust. Just mild steel, but you know, it's all good. Um, there is a bit of rust there in the t in the uh, spare wheel well, but uh, there's nothing really else to write home about. Sway bar lengths are gone, pan hard rods probably gone. Uh, I dare say these springs have been cut in this thing, but uh, we're going to get the tank in and then I'm going to fart around with the rear brakes. But first, I'm going to take that tow ball off because it's going to make it a hundred times easier to put the tank in. So tanks ready to go in. What I've got here is a VL tank. So this really is not ideal to be putting in the car. Um, the VK Carby one will not work. Uh, so the reason I'm using a VL is because it's got a return line. As you can see, it has been pinched off. So I'm gonna use this as a return line. Um, hopefully it works. I mean, looking at this, the outlet is higher than the return line, so that should still, should still work. Even though the tank was in, I was still waiting on a fuel pump. So in the meantime, I decided to rip the seats out of the silver wreck and the console out of the brown wreck. And I also tried bleeding the rear brakes, which didn't bleed up, but I managed to bleed up the front brakes fairly easily. This is just a external fuel pump. You know, it's nothing to write home about. I'm not gonna have a 40 minute unboxing video. They also run a fuel dampener, which is this guy. So, post pump, so over here. Uh, these are extremely hard to find. So what this does, it smooths out the injector pulse and makes it essentially run a bit nicer. So I've actually found this in a VR Commodore. Um, they are mounted behind the throttle body on these. 
but yeah, essentially the same thing. There's, there's only one place that makes these vintage Commodores and at this point in time, they are out of stock. So I went and stole this out of a car out of the paddock. All right, those playing at home, this is what it looks like. Fairly agricultural, but it will do the job. Um, I didn't see the sense in buying a fuel line that goes with a bend that would cost me like 20 to $40 when I could just do that for now. Um, if this all works, maybe I'll go ahead and buy it to tidy it all up, but this is purely just to get it to run. Also, one last thing, I was missing something. I don't know if you can see it in the earlier part of the video, but in the fuse box, I am missing this. So this is the seven pin plug for the EFI. Like that. Cue in my introduction to 80s fuel injection. That previous clip was morning. It is now late afternoon. But this was just the first of many long days chasing electrical problems. So I'm trying to get power to this guy. So he runs off of negative on the coil and it's an ignition supply. I could not find anything to make this work. And then I found for this wire so like I said he goes to the negative on the coil and we've got power my next problem is this is obviously the fuel pump wiring so he goes to there but battery's connected key is on He doesn't do anything. So I've jerry-rigged uh, this up. This feeds the connection from there to there for the fuel pump. But even with that connected, I still wasn't getting power to that. So I've had to wire this in straight from the battery and that provides fuel pump with power. And now it will do this. Can't understand what it's doing. So when it touches and is held on there, does nothing, take it away. Same with positive. There's no crank signal. Check for open circuits in the wire from the starter motor to the wiring connector. Battery supply. 
Terminal 9. So I figured out what this goes to. One wire goes into the cab and the other one goes to the idle load compensator. Now this is triggered when the aircon starts, so that would be why it triggers the fuel pump. Obviously you need more fuel when the aircon's running because your engine's working harder. Um, I've also, if I can get it off, I've also lost fuel pressure. Dribbles out at best. I've really been fighting this AFI. I ended up running a wire from the ignition to the fuel pump, and then I bridged the fuel pump to the injectors, and it won't do anything except cough and fart. And so I am going to give in to my intrusive thoughts here. And they are this right here. I'm going to put a carby on it or if you're a pole barn garage fan, a fuel toilet. I do like that saying for it, it's a good one. Um, I could keep going with this EFI and, you know, spend thousands upon thousands of money on it. And I could be in the same scenario. So I'm just gonna do with what I know. All right, so let's shoot through this. There's a couple of things you need to know if you're doing a carby to EFI conversion. The carby manifold will not work with the EFI extractors. You need to use extractors from a carby model. As you can see, those inner ones are completely different. Pipe. So hopefully your extractors won't come out in two pieces like mine did. Mine were actually snapped and held together with a beer can and some hose clamps. Aside from that fantastic fabrication work, I realised in this point in time that the car was actually too low and my lower back was absolutely killing me. Aside from that, the rear bolt wouldn't line up so I had to open up that cutout at the end of the extractors a little bit. Once that was done, then it was on to the inlet manifold. Now, the inlet manifold needed the holes for the studs to be opened up a little bit more, but once that was done, we could do this. That's right, it was doing the exact same thing as it did when it was EFI. Now, to be fair, on my behalf, when it was EFI, it was not getting fuel pressure, or the fuel pump was not working, and I wasn't getting power to the injectors. So I ended up doing a compression test. Now these are fairly simple. What you want to do is pin the throttle. I normally zip tie it to the manifold pinned open. All the plugs out and then go for gold. I also like to tape the leads up and number them all so I don't have to think when I put them back on. All in all, the compression test didn't tell me much. You want about a 10% range between highest and lowest. My highest was 110 and my lowest was 85. Well and truly over 10%, it's more like 30%, but it really shouldn't have stopped this thing from running. Putting the plugs back together, I found this. Now that really would not have helped the situation. So uh, out to the paddock to find another. It's another morning on the VK Berlina. Isn't it great? Um, so it still won't start. So what I've done is, the dizzy is somewhat loose, I can... So what I've done is, I've just backed it off as much as I can, pretty much. And uh, I'm gonna try and start it and see what it does. 
Joe Rudd have to lie. Well, that's better than it said it does. All right, so now that I've got it running, it's now back in the shed. I know I'm going the wrong way. It's meant to be getting driven and whatnot. Um, I need to swap the carb over. It will not idle. Shush, bad. I'll feed you in a second. Um, so the carb that's on it likes to pin it. I also don't have a throttle bracket or a throttle cable. The EFI one is shorter. And then I need to put a brake drum on and I also need to cut the exhaust off and do a few vacuum lines. I don't have vacuum advance hooked up and I don't have the vacuum line for the transmission hooked up. So a few small jobs that I need to get through. It also doesn't have water or a fuel source. So I've got to sort those out. Remove the carb. Have a look at this one. Note the angle here that it, uh, you know, you have to really force it to get in there, the resting position. Whereas that one returns all the way. Keeps slipping off here too. That's why when I run a car with this one, it absolutely pins it. All right, I'm gonna do a throttle cable. The uh, carby one's like half a meter longer than the uh, EFI one. Well, he's only a tiny guy. So that is the $750 fuel injected VK Blinner, and this is my cool new hat. <laughs> oh, I look like a jackass. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> this thing has been a massive thorn in my side to try and get it to run. The fuel injection side of things, I spent like six days just doing wiring, and I don't mean six days, you know, one or two hours there. I mean six, you know, 10 hour days. So. That was why I reverted back to the carby. I just had enough. Apart from that, this thing ran really well once it did run. Um, driving wise, this thing sucks. Um, I got about 30 feet out and I had a massive knock coming from the driver's side strut. And aside from that, when I went to steer, it heavily understeered. I think that comes down to how low this car actually is. 
and how flat the front tires were and how fatigued all those front end components are make sure before you go to leave a like comment subscribe all that jazz it really helps the algorithms and helps more people see my videos but until then take it easy